for the third and final time, I have the same stuff on the board for the, that I had last couple weeks. I just added a couple more things, okay? Mostly because of a new scientific study that got released this week that I want to share and show where it fits in. We are a, a, a company that is dedicated to helping people with mental health and addiction and trying to unify the world uh, politically, uh, spiritually speaking, through religions. Okay, and it's a noble goal, it's a big goal, it's a high goal, okay, it's pretty hard, but if we see, if we follow the new science, we're going to be able to tell why it is the unification of all of us, not only is it the goal, it's going to happen, we're all going to eventually get there. I'm going to show you that through some science today, and then weave it back into what we've been talking about the last, for the, through the last three weeks. Now, I just showed the group here uh, a video from 60 Minutes, I'll link it to... Uh, to everyone out there that's watching down below in the in the comment section, I'll link it so that you can see it's an fMRI, which is the functional um, MRI machine that it, that 10 years ago, 60 Minutes did a very good piece on it, in which it demonstrated how we all have the same concepts in the same spot in our brain, just like our pinkies are in the same spot. If you're thinking of a screwdriver, and I'm thinking of a screwdriver, it's the same spot in our brain. If you think of Jennifer Aniston, Google Jennifer Aniston neuron. If you think of Jennifer Aniston, a neuron for Jennifer Aniston pops up in your head, okay? Which means what we're finding out with science and, 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 and artificial intelligence and all that is that we have extremely similar brains, perhaps exactly the same. They function, uh, the, they can have the capability of functioning the same way with very few exceptions. Most of us are operating like that. Just like we could all do certain things with our pinkies, but we do different things, okay? We all have similar phones. If we have similar phones, doesn't mean we text the same or download the same um, you know, photos or whatever, but the potential's there. And here's where you're gonna see the unity going through some of the concepts we've been talking about. So this is the study that just got released last week. And the headline says, progress on mind reading technology is sparking ethical concerns. Now we're not gonna address the ethical concerns today. We're gonna talk about how this fits into the unifying process of spirituality. AI has enabled technology that can decode our thoughts, causing some to think twice. Devices that can read our minds are a step closer to becoming reality. Researchers at the University of Texas have reported they successfully used a brain scanner paired with an AI language model to glean the gist of a person's thoughts and translate them into words. It marks the first non-invasive technique able to translate thoughts into continuous speech. Now this article goes on, it says it's published in Nature Neuroscience just last week. It goes on to describe how they did this, okay? Now, I watched some of this, and it specifically demonstrates they can scan a person's brain while they're watching a movie, and the computer says what the person's thinking. And the person doesn't even have to actively be thinking. It picks up the general gist of what the person is thinking. Then they ask the person, they're like, yeah, that's what I was thinking and feeling, exactly as that scene was happening, okay? And this goes on to say, and I love this line, which fits right in with what we're working on, this is one of the, the co-authors of the study. He says, I think we are decoding something that is deeper than language, okay? Decoding something that is deeper than language, thank you. Okay, so I changed what we were calling God as a human experience into decoding God as a human experience, right? By recognizing there is like scientific data behind all these concepts that prophets are talking about. And if we all have extremely similar brains, there's a very similar process that we're all walking through. And I'm going to use some of the spiritual teachings to back that up. Uh, I have a video from a couple years ago on our channel uh, that talked about the five stages of growth for all of us. Kabbalah says there's five stages and we're all on the same journey, but we're in different stages. The first stage is basic needs. We all need our basic needs met. Y'all wouldn't be sitting here talking to me if you hadn't eaten for several days, most likely. And if your house was on fire, you'd be tending to that. If you don't have safety, if you don't have shelter, if you don't have food and water, you're not going to be worried about much of anything else. Fair? Logical? And all of us address that first. But we're not satisfied with just having basic needs. We want to have a lot of them. If I have a sandwich today, that's great, but I also want a sandwich tomorrow. And so we seek something called wealth. I want a sandwich for the next couple months. I want to know that sandwiches are assured for my near future. Now, if I'm stuck in the basic needs phase, I'm going to be trying to aspire towards wealth, and that's the second step. I want a lot of my basic needs so I can reduce my stress. Logical. But it's not enough to have a sandwich for today and tomorrow and the next day. I don't want you to come steal my sandwiches, okay? I now need power. I need to be able to keep people away from my sandwiches. 
I also want the authority to control things like laws, for example, so I can determine, you know, I can maintain my stuff, my property, and keep other people from taking it. That's where power comes in. And all throughout the world, people are fighting over territories. And again, that's part of um, our wiring. All of us are in these three, uh, go through these three phases. Once you've got your basic needs met, and you have enough sandwiches for them to last you for a while, or you're confident you will, and you have the ability to protect that, we can now use our intellect to explore the world differently, including debating how we're going to distribute the sandwiches, right? And talking about how we can fix this place, using our minds, mostly our ego minds, to try to figure out what the heck is going on here. And you can go exploring tons of stuff. You could do philosophy. You could, you know, play music. You could um, work on art. You could play sports. I and mean, on and on and on. Use your mind to explore a bunch of different things. I'm going to connect that, though, to the human experience discussed in, in Buddhism, the first noble truth, and also another Kabbalah teaching that I, I did a, a group on once before. Kabbalah, or Buddhism's first noble truth of the Buddha is that we're all going to suffer. We suffer. The word is dukkha. And we all suffer because we're attached to things. And I just named a bunch of them. We get attached to physical things. We get attached through desires to physical experiences. I want this to happen. No, I want this to happen. No, I wish that didn't happen. We have regrets and shame and guilt all associated to the physical stuff that we experience. That's the first noble truth of Buddhism. And it's we're all going to suffer. That's all of us again. Just like I said in the brain. We all have similar brains. If you're attached to something in particular and it doesn't go your way, you're going to suffer because of it. Well, Kabbalah teaches, in this little heart that I have here, we have 613 different desires. Each one of them you could get addicted to. You could put chemicals up there. You could put alcohol up there. You could put sex up there. You could put money up there. You could put sports up there. On and on and on. Relationships. All of them are desires that we have. And yet there's one desire right in the middle. They call it the point in the heart that everyone has. And that one desire is for, is for spiritual growth. That one desire is ultimately for God or the creator as they say it. And that's the one addiction that works. The one thing that brings us all together is the dropping of the ego desires and all these things that we're obsessing over. This is Kabbalah backing up the Buddha or Buddha backing up the Kabbalah. I can weave Jesus in here just fine too. All of them work together because all of us have the same brains and we all have the same ability to work on attaching and detaching. It's conceptual, okay? And so if we work on that one specific desire for spiritual growth, that's the one addiction that works. And with that comes a chemical uh, avalanche, really, chemical cocktail of endorphins and dopamine and serotonin and GABA and dimethyltryptamine and anandamide, all these chemicals that, that, that mirror street drugs. Yet they're all naturally occurring in the head. Why? Because we went on a spiritual journey. And Kabbalah teaches in the five stages that after you're done with your intellect, exploring all the things that ultimately won't work, like Buddha says, all the physical world, it's, it's a, a temporary experience, and it's all composite experience, it's going to break down, it's not going to work. The only thing that's left is stage five, and that's spirituality. The only thing that we have that will work, and it's the end stage, because there isn't a stage six, is actually figuring out what's going on here. What is the meaning of life? What happens afterwards? Is there a life after death? Is there some sort of God? And anyone that gets into that stage of development has what I'm calling God as a human experience. Because it brings about what we're going to talk about the, the rest of today using that article. Everyone has the capability of doing this because it brings about a deep connection feeling with everyone else. Right? And it brings about uh, a, a deep sense of peace, which is what most people who are using drugs are seeking. A deep sense of peace, chemically. And yet, not going to work. Okay, The only way to do it is to do it naturally, which we all have the ability to do. And so when I was talking the last couple weeks about how we start out as pure consciousness, you know, before we're born, we don't have lab labels, we don't have an identity. Okay, We're told what we are. We're told what religion to follow. We're told what clothes to wear and what customs we have. We're told that, right? And if we blame our parents for that, they get to blame their parents. And their parents can blame their parents. There's no end to the blame, right? The fact is we all go through it. We all get conditioned. And as we get conditioned, we go through this process. I talked about that in the Song of the Pearl. The, the, the young man who set out into the country to go find his, his, the pearl, and he forgets because he identifies so much with the culture that he just moved into. He assimilates and he forgets his mission. Well, that's us. Like it says in Genesis, Adam was sent into a deep sleep. We were born with pure consciousness 
and then we forgot that. It's easy to forget because when we're babies, we don't have any control over any, everything. People tell you what you are and what to do and you know how to act and all that kind of stuff. And so we grow up on this path, what I'm calling the way, in which we all take on an ego experience. And then the labels show up. We have forgotten what we are, a little slice of God, or what Kabbalah is describing as that one desire that works, the point in the heart. They call it a spiritual embryo. It's a little baby spirit that's inside each one of us. And it needs to develop. Just like an embryo, physical embryo has to develop, a spiritual embryo has to develop. And all of us have to do that. But if we don't tend to our spiritual selves, it won't grow. Many of Jesus' teachings and the stories about his teachings of feeding, you know, like feeding the, the loaves and the fish story, is about feeding the soul, right? And it's not about Jesus whipping up a bunch of uh, uh, food, fish sandwiches for everyone, okay? Maybe that's how it happened, but for sure he fed our souls. When your soul gets fed with spirit and bread, for example, truth makes your soul grow. Spirit is like blood for the soul. It makes it grow. And when you practice these things, your process of the way is getting to this point where you are embodying the original consciousness. It's the Alpha and the Omega. You started out as spirit, you end up as spirit. Along the way, we go through this ego process. There is no other way out of this. This is the entire game, if you will, that we're all in. Along the way, we have the experience of, um, we talked about from the book, The Lost Symbol, in order to get there, when we are in tune with the vibration, our consciousness touches the source of knowledge. Well, here's where I want to interject a Buddhist story, a Buddhist teaching of uh, a family of four who are arguing over money, largely. Uh, the mother and the father and the oldest son are arguing over whether or not to get him a new bike. And the youngest child is observing all of this. And late at night, uh, four old men show up at the door. It's raining outside, and they go to invite the old men in. The old men say, we're not coming in unless you invite, them, invite us in in the right order. And their names are success, wealth, peace, and harmony. And so each of the people in the family decide, well, who should we let in first? And the father wants wealth. He wants to be able to buy a bike for his kid. He wants to have more uh, money for, for his family. And the son wants success. He wants to be able to have his parents feel proud of him. And the mom is sick of all the arguing, and so she says, I just want peace, okay? And they were all wrong. The youngest kid says, the only way this is going to work is, is if we all get along. And so the youngest kid said, let's invite in harmony. And when harmony came in, peace came next, then success, then wealth. It all follows in that direction. Well, what's harmony? Harmony is what we're here to do spiritually, to recognize that we have to get along. We can't keep arguing about physical world stuff. What is, what is more harmonious than loving your enemy? That's pretty high-end harmony teaching. Harmony works. When you, when you go with the flow of your existence, instead of resist it, instead of saying, gee, I wish this didn't happen, that's not harmony. But like, hey, I'm going to learn and grow from this, that's harmony. And when you know that everyone else in the world is, on this, is in this process, um, when I'm talking about the five stages, it's similar to something called the hero's journey. We're going to do a, a group on that, that soon, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. All of us are on the same journey. We're just at different phases, just like uh, elementary school. Different phases of development. And what we have is most of the world arguing with other people who are at different phases of development, and they don't realize they're playing the same game. And so it's not about acquiring all the materials ultimately. You move through that phase. You get to a phase where it's not about debating right and wrong in the flesh. It's are you going to find the point, of, in, uh, of the point in the heart yourself, and are you going to develop it? That's it. And so here we have a brain, like I showed you with the MF fMRI video, and current brain scanners, an AI, that's going to tell us. I mean, that's what's going to happen next. I'm not afraid of AI at all. What AI is going to do is make it clear to us what our destiny is. Our destiny is to come together in unity with each other. Does it mean we have to have uh, the same favorite foods or the same favorite music? No, it doesn't. I just have to be in harmony with you. That's how chords work, right? It has to sound good together, um, and you can disagree with me, but I will still respect you. Can people still love each other and disagree? Well, love your enemy. Now I'm in harmony with the enemy. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus, and all the rest will be added to you. That's the Buddhist teaching. Seek first the kingdom of heaven is finding the harmony within. That, there comes the chemical avalanche again of, of all the good neurotransmitters. And then now you feel at peace. You don't need drugs anymore because you found the harmony inside yourself.
But if we spend all our, all our lives resisting that which is happening or regretting things that we've done, we will never get there. But we must look at each other and we must go through this process and we must tap into this pure consciousness again. And as we go through it, we are now in harmony. We now vibrate with spirit. And you know it if you're doing it because you can feel it that way. You also know it when you're not doing it because you're out of harmony. And this all comes together with what I closed with when Krishna says in order to experience the Holy Spirit or to bring the infinite spirit into oneself, you must perceive unity in everyone else. We must perceive each other as a team. Every good football team, a good football team, if someone fumbles, you don't criticize the guy for fumbling while the ball's still alive, right? You cover the teammate's fumble, okay? This is what we should be doing with each other. It's what forgiveness and mercy are and being patient with each other. Cover each other's fumbles. And then you have to tell the person, dude, stop carrying the ball so low, high and tight. You know, that's how you run the ball, whatever. We are allowed to correct each other. All the prophets did. Some of my favorite experiences is reading deep into scripture and seeing how very crystal clear Jesus uh, is when it comes to teaching us and saying you're going to be, you're a hypocrite if you think you're going to come to back to this state of being just by believing that I did it. You have to do it too. So, so many different teachings are like that. Just like a good football coach will chew you out because he wants the team to get better. Can we chew each, out, uh, each other out with love? Yes. But if we judge each other and I'm better than or I'm worse than you, we just lost it. We're not in harmony. We are all teammates. This video is showing us, uh, or the, the study I just read, we're teammates. The, our brains are like exactly the same, very close. And if we don't get in harmony, th harmony with each other, we won't experience the unity. And then our game will just keep going on. But it's a fait accompli. I'm confident AI is going to demonstrate this. Oh, wow, there's a mental state that's optimal. Okay, no kidding. And it's not going to be found through amount of money you have or amount of relationships that you've had or whether or not you've had any kids or whether or not you ever got elected president. It's going to be found in the state of mind that you have. Best thought of as virtue. And best thought of is whether or not you're capable of living in harmony with each other.